Good morning and good afternoon to our friends and colleagues in mainland Europe. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here in the IIEA. You're all very welcome to our webinar on security and democracy in the digital age. We are honoured today to have with us Thomas Hendrik Ilvis, who is the widely known as leading the digitalization of Estonia. A former two-term president of Estonia, he is a leader with a vision who fundamentally changed Estonia and also provides us all with an example, particularly for Europe and indeed globally, of what is possible once you have a clear vision and a political leadership. Tomás, you are very welcome back to the IIEA. We last met back in 2012 when you inspired us with your actual work, what was happening in Estonia. But it's different place, different times today, and we look forward to your presentation. Today's event is the second in the IIEA's project entitled Europe's Digital Future, which is exploring the topic of digital sovereignty in Europe. As part of this project, which is supported by Google, the IIEA will host a series of events and undertake research exploring what the concept of digital sovereignty means and what future it might hurl for the EU and for small and open economies like Ireland. Tomás will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes or so, and then I will go to your audience for questions. I look forward to you joining us in our discussion, and you can do that by joining through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. It would be great if you sent in your questions during uh, Tomás' uh, presentation, and I would really appreciate if you would give your name and affiliation when you ask the questions. Thank you so much. Please feel free to join us on Twitter and our handle is at IIEA. And the presentation and Q&A as usual is on the record. Digital technologies are impacting our lives, how we live, work and play. Technology can, as we see from the impact of emerging technologies like AI, IoT, blockchain, help us redefine problems create solutions and help us reinvent the future. However, issues like cybersecurity permeates all aspects of our activities. We hear about the consequence of cyber technology for political and social affairs, including the disruptive and empowering effects of e-democracy practices, online voting, the implications of fake news, disinformation and other and voter manipulation. Today's webinar is timely and important. President Ilves will outline the threats, dangers, and the imperatives of defending against these challenges. He will also discuss the role of the European Union and ask the question, is the European Union a structure better suited to confront these challenges? Today, former President Ilves continues to make a major and significant impact to global issues and to a range of key institutions and organizations. Prior to being president, he was the first post-independent ambassador to the USA. He also served as an MEP as vice president of Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. He has served as chair of the World Economic Forum on Cybersecurity. He is a member of Kofi and Annan's foundations on global commission on elections and democracy in the digital age. He is also a commissioner of the Transatlantic Commission on Electoral uh, Election Integrity in the Alliance of Democracies. He's been a visiting fellow to numerous universities, including Stanford University, and is currently a member of the board of the Center for Technology and Global Affairs in Oxford University. He's published widely and received many international awards. I wouldn't have time to go through them, but I just mentioned his last one, which he received the world leader in cybersecurity by Boston Global Forum. Thank you again, uh, President Elvis, for joining us today. It's an honor to have you with us and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's great to uh, be back, as it were. Uh, I'd like to be there non-virtually, but unfortunately at this time, <clears throat> it's not really possible. 
Let me try this today. I mean, it's going to be a, a tough thing to do this all in 20, 25 minutes, but um, because I'm going to try to cover two, two related topics. Um, one of them is actually uh, less about uh, the actual security in the sort of international context, but to talk about uh, what we have done in Estonia. Uh, and very briefly, we have Basically, in my country, you can do everything digitally except for three things, getting married, getting divorced, and selling property. You have to show up for that, and that's to, uh, to avoid problems with uh, anonymous shell companies, which we, for, at an early age, banned for fairly, fairly obvious reasons having to do with our, um, <clears throat> our geopolitical location. The essence of the Estonian system that allows us to do all of this and including voting, I would add, uh, is that we have a very, uh, we have, a, have had since the year 2001, the system that allows us to do all interactions with, with uh, government and public services. It has three pillars. One is you, we have a secure, digital identity available, I mean, that is mandatory for everyone. Uh, and it is available in various forms. You, get, you have it on your phone, but we also all have a, a, a card that looks like the, a traditional ID card with a chip on the back with which we log on and which we, with which we authenticate our identity and enables us to uh, do digital signatures equivalent to uh, wet signatures or pen signatures, which basically has reduced a huge amount of work and time. The, uh, in addition, the ID is absolutely necessary because uh, you cannot, you don't know uh, who's who on the internet. And you may recall the, uh, the cartoon from the New Yorker from some uh, 26 years ago uh, of two dogs um, in front of a computer and one dog says to the other on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Well, we cannot allow that in, in cyberspace. You must know who you're talking to uh, and therefore you must be authenticated. Secondly, we have an architecture which is a distributed architecture um, about <clears throat> in which there is no central database. Everything is distributed around the uh, around in various uh, servers in the cloud, but in order to access anything, you must be authenticated. Um, and these, of course, communicate among each other also in a, a, through authentication. And the final thing to which there's very little attention paid, unfortunately, um, is the issue of data integrity. Um, Everyone is worried about privacy. Privacy is so, if someone finds out what my blood type is, someone finds out what my bank account is. The real problem we face is what happens if someone changes your blood type in, on your medical record. And then, I mean, that can have fatal consequences. Uh, changing my bank account uh, obviously is a lot worse than, um, than, than just publishing it, especially given how meager it is. Uh, and moreover, that um, it's unlikely they will increase your bank account size. Uh, those are the three pillars upon which this system is based and which has been operating continuously without a break since 2001 and has now been adopted and copied by Finland, uh, Denmark, at least the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Panama, Moldova, Azerbaijan to a certain degree. Uh, uh, Greece has taken this system over and I in fact spent uh, 2019, 19, beginning of 20 until COVID struck advising the Greek government that has now gone over to digital, digital services. So that's that's one side of things, and this is why we are known as a digital country. If you want to read about it in a, in a more sort of non-technical but sophisticated way, the New Yorker of December 2018, that one of those weeks in there, uh, has a long article called The Digital Republic. 
The other reason Estonian, uh, Estonia is known in the digital world is that any history of cyber attacks will begin, or of cyber war, will begin with Estonia when in 2007 we were attacked by Russia uh, with what are called DDoS attacks. A DDoS attack is, a, the DDoS stands for dig, <clears throat> Distributed Denial of Service. And a DDoS attack entails massive amount, massive pings on very on a server. Uh, originally from bots, but now more from uh, Internet of Things devices such as CCTVs. Uh, and the idea is that you overload a server so it, re it no longer responds. Uh, and in 2007, <clears throat> April May, we were su <clears throat> subjected to one of these attacks that took down government sites, uh, the banks and media. So we were basically cut off uh, or we couldn't, uh, we couldn't get those services. And the only, the only way we could in fact uh, take our first steps to actually um, restore service was to cut off all communications with the outside world. If, if something did not have our, uh, our upper domain, which is .ee, just as you are, what, dot ie uh, that if it didn't come from there we, you couldn't get into anything and this allowed us to restore service domestically and so following von Clausewitz's definition of war is the continuation of policy by other means um, this is uh, this was a classic case now my main and when we look at where we are today um, when it comes to security uh, we have had since um, since our pre-hominid ancestors, perhaps even baboons and uh, bonobos and chimps, we have seen conflict uh, in which you fight or try to kill members of your own species and usually in a group. So, that's that. I mean, since anyone took up a stick or a rock to to attack an, a member of your own species from another band or something, uh, all of this war has been all of this, which is sort of proto-war. But throughout history, it has been kinetic. It's I mean, it's very kinetic, meaning you something that weighs something moves a certain distance and you use that to harm someone. Uh, so whether you hit someone on the head with a rock or you attack them with a missile, it's all kinetic. Until about 2000. In the year 2000, we began to see first in the form of uh, espionage, uh, the first publicly known hack by a political uh, by a political adversary was the Moonlit Mile hack of 1999 against the US Department of Defense. There were probably things before that, but publicly we know of that as the first time that anything was done in digital space um, that, could be that could be related to conflict. Espionage is, uh, is a special case, I would argue, because nothing bad is done except they steal your secrets. Or in the case of what we have seen in the United States um, from presumably China, uh, theft of intellectual property, which is, um, which is thought to be one of the biggest threats to the US economy of the last 20 years. It gets a little dicier when you start hacking things that are getting sensitive. One of the biggest hacks that has ever taken place, and certainly one of the most damaging, is known as the OPM hack of the United States. OPM is the Office of Personnel Management in uh, and where they had 23 million personnel records from of United States civil servants stolen is thought to be China, but they, we either, they, they don't know or they don't tell us. 
But in any case, this included things such as this, the, all of the home addresses of anyone who's ever worked for the US federal government, uh, whatever records they have on them, uh, including the psychological profiles of people working for the Central Intelligence Agency. So it gets pretty granular. Uh, and all of this was copied. And of course, the lack of awareness, even on the part of the United States, which we usually think of as the most sophisticated people in this regard, they had, um, they had stored all of that data in clear text. It was not even encrypted. So all you had to do was get in, suck it out, and then you, they had the information. Now that's already getting sort of borderline. It's, this, is, uh, this could be quite dangerous, obviously, for all of the people who ever worked for the, for the US government. And those are the kinds of things that we're facing at the level of espionage. Uh, so that was done by uh, what we call a hack, uh, but since espionage is not considered or is considered okay to do, it, uh, we do not get into counterattacks with espionage, it, as, a, as annoying as it might be. This is, um, and this is why the recent solar winds hack that basically got into everything remotely security related in the United States, as well as much of the private sector. Uh, there, it, the uh, US government is loath to counterattack. And then finally, we have sabotage. And sabotage is what, uh, when you actually cause kinetic damage using digital means. Uh, and you, this can do, you can basically do, given the level of digitization of everything these days, you can do on anything, ranging from, as I mentioned, these cyber attacks on um, knocking out parts of the Ukrainian and Georgian grid only yesterday or the day before, ranging to something that actually happened uh, six, seven years ago where a disgruntled employee of the Los Angeles traffic department, hacked into the system, and at one point um, turned all of the traffic lights in Los Angeles red. And you can imagine what a, what a total snafu uh, came from that and the massive tie-up. But actually, if you think about it, you realize that they could have done something far, far worse, which would have taken months to untangle probably, which is if in a city, a big city like that, you turn all of the traffic lights green, yes. uh, in which case you will probably have hundreds of thousands of car accidents and trying to, I mean, and the damage would be immense. So, I mean, given that we are moving towards, um, uh, towards, um, all kinds of, um, I mean, the digitization of everything, all of these uh, digitized processes need to be made secure. And this is really the task of, of, uh, of any form of cybersecurity. Um, and that's what we have to deal with. Um, this is why we have at the most basic level in my country, the requirement for authentication in order to get into anything that is government related. Um, it takes a little more time, but that's what life is about. I mean, it's going to, you save a lot of time through digitization. Some of it you have to give up by not getting in as easily as you, as you might want to. Now, where things start edging into the real, the real threats, I argue to Europe, is uh, that um, basically in, in political processes are being dramatically affected through digitization and in ways that uh, we could have never conceived of, both in what is traditional so-called cyber and also in the sort of more in terms of propaganda. On traditional cyber, what we have is that there are two hacking groups in Russia. There are many others, but I will focus on these two because they seem to have focused on liberal democracies in the transatlantic area. And they're called, by, they're designated by uh, CIA as APT-28 and APT-29 or Advanced Persistent Threat 28 and Advanced Persistent Threat 29. 
They're also known as fancy bear and cozy bear and they have all kinds of various names. But these are the people who hacked into Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, servers. Uh, and then as we is now seems quite clear, gave the material over to Julian Assange, who then published this material on WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks in 2016. And uh, apparently, uh, I mean, it is uh, statistics show they probably had a determining effect on the outcome of that, uh, of the US election then. Uh, the UK government is not showing anything. They are hiding the material or, but hear me. We can hear you now. Okay. You're welcome back. This is what happens. Uh, I, I, I assume we weren't attacked. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we weren't. <laughs> this has never happened to me. <laughs> I have to say it, ha it hasn't happened to us either. So um, we, we, we'll investigate it later and see are there any sinister uh, aspects to it. Well, it happened on my side since I have my son and my daughter-in-law here and they all went out. And so I oh. restarted the whole system. Okay. So Thank you very see. much. Where was I? <laughs> you, you were talking about the political, you know, the political side yeah. of what's happening. Uh, in well, we had the, yeah, okay, I, can I, wear, I mean, in, what happened in 2017 in France was that uh, uh, the Macron team, realizing what had happened to, um, to Hillary yeah. Clinton, seeded their campaign server with such egregious fakes <laughs> but which would be scandalous. So they were in fact hacked. But and then when they uh, published this material, the fakes, they, I mean, they were Macron planted fakes. And of course, as soon as the, I mean, and so the, uh, the, the bad guys, as it were, went crazy on this saying, look at this. And then the Macron team said, look at this, this these are obvious fakes. And they managed to um, sort of, get rid of that problem in France. The point, however, is, is that you can use digital means now to uh, manipulate elections and to manipulate political process. Now, if you think about that, then you really recast the nature of, of um, well, I don't know, conflict or the continuation of policy by other means. Why would, for example, in the case of say Russia and Europe or NATO, uh, why would they bother uh, launching a massive campaign, a military campaign? I mean, during the Cold War, we had this concept of the Fulda Gap, which was this city in Germany, still in, where it was thought that across the plains of Germany, the oncoming Soviet armies of the Warsaw Pact would all charge in and, and try to reach the Atlantic. Well, in fact, you don't have to do that anymore. If you don't like NATO, as they clearly don't, and you don't like the European Union, well, what's the best thing to do now? Is cheapest way to do it is to disaggregate, to use Donald Rumsfeld's term also against the EU, to disaggregate the EU by fomenting uh, within the European Union uh, vociferous tendency. Brexit is one example, but you can foment this in lots of countries and they do. Uh, if you want to cause problems within the EU, you can spread all kinds of disinformation. Currently, first and foremost, regarding um, the um, regarding vaccination, we have a terrible problem here where Russian language media, which is watched by about a quarter of our people, is complete anti Pfizer propaganda saying it's all poison and you can only use the only one that's any good is, um, is Sputnik. The problem is that EU has not. Uh, has not uh, authorized Sputnik. And so we're, we're I mean, we're, we're constantly dealing with disinformational 
um, campaigns, which are also available. And here I'm moving from hacking on to content. Um, this is all enabled by the digital means of social media. In many ways, when I say that everything sort of started in 2000 with hacking, actually the real dramatic change in political manipulation via the web uh, happened as a result of two things in the early 2000s. One of them was the invention of Facebook, which was originally just local to Harvard and then the Ivy League University. And you had social media, this is the first social media. It did not have that big an effect because it was restricted to people who had computers. The real thing, what changed, and which was kind of the, the, the combination that has completely changed the world in terms of, especially I mean, in all kinds of ways, but especially when it comes to threats in the digital world, is the, is the smartphone coming out in 2006, first with uh, the iPhone by Apple and later on to all the various Android variants that came out shortly thereafter and the decision of Mark Zuckerberg to turn Facebook into a mobile phone app, which then that's what was done. And now they have almost 4 billion people on Facebook. And of course, all of the other social media uh, forms that developed after that, which means that the first time in history, you can basically communicate with almost any. If you have 4 billion smartphones and you have you know, 3 billion people on Facebook and who knows how many another, we also have WeChat, Weibo, and all of those, that you can, uh, that if in the past you had a, say, a nutcase Nazi living in your town, you didn't know any other nutcase Nazis because they were in some other town. Whereas in the United States today, all of the crazy, I mean, that's in the case of the United States because, I mean, that's the most studied, but you can see, be it ISIS, be it um, the United States, uh, I mean, the hard right in the US or the hard right in Europe, I mean, they, are, they have all met each other through the internet and through social media. And then they have closed social media groups, all of which has led to, um, rather sort of major destabilizing threats using the medium of social media. Uh, and this has been politically, this has been weaponized. I would say that the, the next step in this development after the development of social media was, it was the Arab Spring in 2011 where everyone was rejoicing that look how civil society can overturn oppressive governments using Twitter and Facebook, which they did. The problem with it is that authoritarian regimes looked at this and said, oh, look at how powerful these things, are. and they do, they're doing it without any real state resources. But what if we put our, state resources into social media and into hacking. And so the Russians on their side created the uh, St. Petersburg Internet Research Agency, which is the primary provider of, of uh, uh, nasty fake news social media events, which have had, as we know from uh, at least the Brexit uh, referendum and on through the uh, U.S. election and other elections elsewhere, lots of elections elsewhere, have had a major effect on uh, the democratic process, which means that we are in, we are vulnerable in ways that we have never been vulnerable before this era that we're in. And, um, and when we talk about security, we have to get off our focus of security as a kinetic problem, a kinetic warfare, but really in terms of it's more psychological warfare. It, uh, uh, it is action at a distance. We are not seeing the real employment of force in this classical sense, uh, definition of 
employing mass time acceleration, but rather we can do things from afar and, and in fact get a much better result because you don't have to spend all this money on invading people, you can just change the political climate in the country. And so uh, this has led me at least to think about what can we do. And the first, the problem is in terms of these things, be it uh, strictly hacking, digital sabotage, espionage, or the, um, the more sort of soft end of things in terms of um, propaganda, fake news, et cetera, disinformation, is that we are all in this, I mean, all liberal democracies are subject to this. Um, and then we are asymmetrically subject to it, which is that, I mean, the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians theoretically could alter the results of an election in a democratic country, a liberal democracy. Uh, you're not going to be able to alter the results of a, an election in quotes in Russia. I mean, we know who's going to win. You can even predict, I mean, focus groups will determine what's the optimal percentage to give to Putin. You know, so it looks relatively contested, but relatively overwhelming. So you end up getting 72, 73, or 74% for Putin, even though we know that you know, no popularity stays constant like that. And so, uh, so we are at an asymmetric disadvantage in this regard towards them. And there are things we can think of, we can think of doing back to them, and but that's not for this talk. Certainly, for this, the purposes of this talk, is that what we have to think of what is what we can do for defense. For defense, our biggest drawback right now is that no one talks to anyone else because. The whole realm of cyber and anything digital has grew out initially from signals intelligence, where it was, um, I mean, it's, it's the espionage paradigm is sort of people are just anti sharing. Yes. You have five eyes, right? But that even that doesn't work too well. And when we, when we get to those of us in the Europe, Union, no one anymore any longer is in the five eyes. You know, you're going to have the UK there. And we don't talk to each other. Uh, one of my own personal experiences is when uh, we, in Estonia, we found a Russian worm in our military network. So we went to NATO and um, said, we discovered this Russian worm in our military network. And the response from NATO at that time was, oh, you too which is the wrong response. Um, so what we have today in looking at the entire range and domain of cyberspace, again, from hacking to, to, to disinformation, is that every single country has its own, uh, its own various and often non-communicating non silos, be they academics or then the military or they don't talk to one another, and the, and the encryption people don't talk to the people doing fake news. But much worse than that is that there is virtually no cross and transborder cooperation. Even though the threat vectors are, you know, you can count them on individual, like on one hand. So even though we get this APT 28 and APT 29 and the St. Petersburg Research Agency are attacking all of us. We don't, we don't go around and say, you know, hey, Ireland, we in Estonia discovered this thing. We don't do that. There are no mechanisms for it. So uh, if we want to, if we want to actually be effective, we need to substantially boost this side of security within the European Union with our trustworthy neighbors inside the European Union do the relevant uh, legislation uh, to create this strong defense. Uh, but right now it's ad hoc. It's, I mean, certain countries will talk to one another. And I know that the Germans and the Austrians, because it's German language based, have, you know, have their own little 
thing going, but not much. Uh, I mean, within the EU, yeah. I mean, everyone is protected of, of the information. And so uh, we have ENISA, which is located bizarrely enough in Greece, but in any case, which is the cybersecurity agency. We have a center for cyber in Romania, but we really, I mean, we have these little centers and we think that that's it. That's all we have to do. Uh, instead, we need a very robust approach. And I argue that in fact, you know, we don't need to do the tank thing with, um, with PESCO, rather it should be digital. And then where, we're, where I would finally end up with is that digital renders organizations uh, such as NATO obsolete. I mean, you're going to need things like NATO or hard security structures. However, with the disappearance of, of uh, distance and mass uh, and time or acceleration in the digital era, um, you don't actually, NATO loses much of its importance. Because NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So yeah. Japan, while it's uh, Japan and uh, you know, ANZAC uh, share our liberal democratic values, they are not in NATO either because they're not the North Atlantic. And I would argue again, bring my favorite little country, Uruguay. I mean, they too should be in NATO as, as a you know, one of the best functioning liberal democracies in Latin America. But that doesn't happen because it's because what NATO is built on is you know, tank, tank logistics, bomber range, fighter refueling. I mean, all of this kinetic stuff. Well, let them do the kinetic stuff. I would say that Europe needs to really focus on develop, getting its digital security, right, which then finally gets to the issue of digital sovereignty. Um, now, digital sovereignty, to my mind, looking at what is usually meant by this, it's kind of like this anti-Silicon Valley thing. I mean, it's like we don't like we don't like GAFA or whatever the Fang, however you want to define Facebook, Apple, Netflix, big American companies. Uh, I have no love for those companies, but that's not sovereignty. And we're just focusing on sort of products. What, where if you want to have digital sovereignty, then you focus uh, first, first and foremost on looking at the security aspect. And the other thing I would do, which is sorely missing from Europe, which is really, a, I think, a requisite for sovereignty is a, uh, an integrated digital governance system. So that analogous to, it does not have to be the same tech, but you have to observe the principles of secure identity architecture and, and data integrity so that uh, all of these things are, are secure that if I travel to Dublin and I get sick, and I go to the doctor, I can do what I do in Estonia, which is I authorize, well, I've already authorized them, but I've authorized a doctor to be able to go in and look at my medical record. Ideally, what would happen is that any, any, anywhere you go in the European Union, if you get sick, for example, but this should apply to all services, is that you, uh, I mean, if I get sick, I go to the doctor, I, I identify and authenticate myself with my card or some way and then I authorize him to look at my medical record and if I'm in Greece there's no way I, I might expect that the doctor knows English but there's no way he's going to be able to read my Estonian healthcare record and so he will look at them and they will already because this is so easy to do already he will see my my healthcare records in Greek right before him, and then he can sort of decide whether what it is that I have. Um, I mentioned this because this is the other aspect that we don't, we, not only in the European Union, do we not work on creating a defensive, uh, 
a defense in the cyber realm, which would be much easier for us to do than for NATO already. And secondly, we don't have an integrated system of services. And certainly the Digital Services Act, which I've seen is not very ambitious. And I also don't really quite understand what they're trying to do. It seems to be uh, focused uh, much more on commercial services, which is good, but little attention is paid to fundamental uh, government, uh, government services, uh, public services that should be the interstitial integrating network of the European Union. So I will stop with that because I've already over, I, because of that delay, I went over my 25 minutes, but anyway. Oh, thank that's you. Thank you very um, much uh, for your insights and bringing to us the threats and challenges. There are lots of questions. I don't, can I ask you, are you free to stay on for about 10 minutes over? I have, my, I have, to, I have, to, I have my next meeting in, um, what I guess, in your time. Oh, okay. So we. No, no, I'm saying I have my meet, next meeting is at one o'clock your time. Okay, so oh, we can I'm, stay I'm, on I'm a little bit longer. There. Yeah, thank you very much. Just um, one of our uh, member of the audience, Declan Deasy, just to go back on it, you know, when we did get the break, I asked, um, what were you going to say about the UK before the connection dropped? Was there something <laughs> specific that you wanted to mention? Well, the UK, I don't know what they're going to do. I haven't really seen anything on uh, what their approach is going to be now. They have been, I mean, the problem, one of the problems that we have is that the, um, the anglo sax the Anglosphere, mm. where we are Churchill's English speaking peoples, some uh, have, there's this, for me, I mean, impenetrable connection to me between objections to having a digital identity or having any identity document and uh, speaking English. So, I mean, <laughs> we have no problem in Estonia accepting an identity. And in Europe, you actually do need to, uh, if you want to travel, you must have a travel document, an ID document, right? And you, you can travel across in, within the Schengen room with an uh, ID card. You need an ID card. Um, and so as when we get to digital, um, uh, doing anything digital, you need to have a secure identity. Um, but they don't like it, which is one reason why the United States is lagged so far behind in all areas related to public services. So when I lived in California, in the middle of Silicon Valley, literally in the middle in a 12 kilometer radius, I had uh, the headquarters of Tesla, Google, Apple, VMware, um, Facebook, Palantir, YouTube, and they do amazing things. But if when I wanted to register my child for school, I had to drive uh, three miles down to the head, school headquarters, bring along a copy of my electricity bill, my passport, my wife's passport, and our DS 2019 form, which is something for visiting scholars. And then the person sat there for 20 minutes copying everything out by hand. <laughs> so, I mean, that's an example of, you know, the public sector is, in, is completely undigitized in the United States. Uh, but that's because they won't do IDs and the UK has the same problem, Canada has the same problem, Australia, New Zealand as well, but New Zealand, I think is really. So anyway, what is the UK doing? I don't know, they have, they better digitize you know, if they want to compete, which seems to be their goal. And we've uh, some questions here, thank you for that, uh, from Jackie Fisher from the Department of Finance. And uh, she asks, how does the EU proposal for critical entities resilience directive tie in with your security and democracy in the digital era confirmation along the NS12? I'm going to have to look. I don't really know much about that directive. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it seemed very specific. Um, but I would say we are extremely resilient. In fact, our public service government network never 
never fell during the massive cyber attacks on us. Yeah, very interesting because I think Jackie has another question asking about the um, security, the um, the interconnectedness of Estonia digital network, make it more vulnerable to cyber attack. Well, no, we have found the opposite. Which so, is yeah, no, that's interesting. That since you cannot, uh, I mean, you can knock out a server, but um, but you can't. It's but since you can only access uh, the system through an identity, and the way it works is we have two-factor authentication for all any connections, and we have end-to-end -end encryption. So. If I want to get into something, the reason why we know I'm me and uh, is that in my device, be it a phone or the computer, the uh, my is up with the pre-programmed chip or the pre-programmed program in my computer, and it says you're you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then. From that point on, the connection is all uh, public key infrastructure end to end encryption, which is, uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm not, I won't go into it. I'll just say it's public key infrastructure um, with that, it, which basically is the best encryption we have until we get, um, until it's all ruined by quantum computing, but that's a few years off. Then we're really. Yes. Um, we have another question here from Peter McLoon, who's a member of the board of the IIEA, and he's asking the question, has the digital revolution strengthened the forces that produce inequality with a winner takes all mentality that will, if unchecked with very strong enforceable regulation, make it virtually impossible for small, poorer countries to function as they will have no effective control over what happens in their society? Now, Estonia with 1.3 million has the highest level of unicorns per capita. We have five per cap. We have five unicorns for 1.3 million people. Skype was invented in Estonia, uh, quickly sold. And, um, Transferwise is our latest. Um, we have, um, which is a bank transfer company that is um, Estonian, but. Uh, now, I don't see that. I mean, basically, good ideas come out of wherever people are engaged. Okay. Uh, certainly, in ter I, mean, I would say even more than that. I mean, I digital is, is in many ways the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we're a small country. We can, in terms of, we can inflict a lot of damage <laughs> you know, yeah. if we want. I mean, we don't want to, but clearly the point is that, you know, if you get, you, uh, if you just extend that, a small hacking group in Russia can inflict enormous damage. Uh, we choose not to do that, but the point is that we too can inflict a lot of damage. And in fact, it's not, you know, it's no longer a matter of nuclear throw weight. It's a matter of clever hacks uh, in this world. Right. Um, we instituted, this was my, this is how my little role in this was in um, uh, push to get computers in all schools. Um, and by 1997, 98, there were schools and all, they were all connected. Mm. Now that, I mean, you know, we're, we were a very poor country. I mean, we're really a poor country still back then. Um, you know, with like $8,000, $7,000 uh, GDP per capita, but we just invested in this. Mm. And one of the results was when I went in my last term of office, I mean, I mean, knowing that educational reform takes 15, 20 years to have an effect. You know, 20 years after we had that, it was my last year in office and I would go around and we had all these startups and I would always encourage them. Mm. And I said, and then I started asking, well, so how'd you get started? And I said, 80% of the time, the answer from the founder was, oh, I was a kid in your program. Yes. So, I mean, it's in fact, you know, we, the digital divide is a political problem. It's not a technological problem. Mm -hmm. it, is a, it is a matter of digital or rather of, mm, political will. Um, I mean, 
I mean, why is the EU so backward digitally? Because the, the will is missing. Um, mm -hmm. And why are individual countries very advanced? Because there is a will to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. And since the will is actually necessary because most of the, the bottlenecks are legislative and regulatory, not technical. And yeah. according to Moore, I mean, Moore's law still holds. That means that it's all getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I mean, the amount mm -hmm. of, I mean, we could do what we did in my country 20 years ago, nine, 10 times more cheaply, simply because the cost of computing is so dramatically dropped. So I don't, I don't buy the digital divide argument. Uh, I think that uh, in terms of what is expensive and what is costly, it today is far, far cheaper than it was 20 years ago. And this, is, this should be something that, you know, aid programs should be focusing on. And in fact, um, at least the, I mean, both the World Bank to a degree with, um, with a book that I helped put out in 2016 called Digital Dividends, which you can, which is the most popular, da popularly downloaded book ever produced by the World Bank. And if you go to worldbank.org, you, uh, you can search for digital dividends. And it's like a 400 page book that you can download for free and get a PDF. Hmm. Um, la, the IADB, which is the Inter-American Development Bank, figured this out even more. And uh, I had the wonderful pleasure of being flown all over Latin America because they realized that instead of putting money into all of these brick and mortar projects, actually what was needed was to put money in I mean, sort of technical assistance on getting Latin America digitized. And if you need, you know, cable, well then put money into cable, but after that, it should take off on its own, which it has in some countries. Yes, and uh, you know, just following up on that, so would you say that digital transformation is really about people and leadership then? Yes. You know, it's it's a, a, about having what I talked about earlier, having a vision. Um, and with that in mind, what do you think of you know, the digital agenda that the EU have really forcibly set out together with the green agenda. Do you think that offers a kind of hope and optimism for that, well, you know, transformation? I mean, I, think, I, mean it's, I would say it's, it's 15 years overdue. Mm. Uh, my main problem with it right now, it's too much kind of like a knee jerk reaction against American companies rather than focusing on what we can do and what we can do far better than any American company are public services. And that's where, in any case, Europe is far more uh, public, public service uh, oriented than the mm. United States. And I would say, well, you know, I mean, there are little tweaks you can do. Um, certainly, I think the EU approach, or at least EU member state approach to social media is a little too state focused. I would, um, I would basically make it possible to sue them. I mean, right now in the US, there's this big debate on Section 230 that says that social media platforms are not liable for the content that they carry. I would make them liable for the content that they carry. Right now, instead of saying immediately mean, these boards, you know, we have the F. Facebook oversight board that is looking to see, well, is this permissible or not? I would just, that I would, leave the, I would leave the private sector to the private sector and sue them broke, right? I mean, but in terms of public services, there is nothing in the United States that we would want to emulate at all. And I would focus on that which we can do, and that is digitization of public services yeah, and all of the various yeah. benefits. Mm. Um, I mean, for example, even with COVID, uh, you know, EU vaccination passports as a QR code on your on your uh, on your phone, which I mean. Mm. And the EU can do that for the EU. I mean, then it gets more complex. What do you do if someone comes from Pakistan, right? I mean, do you trust their thing or not? But that's, but first let's focus on the EU. Um, our uh, tracing apps, some of them work cross borders, most of them don't. Again, mm. these are all, these are all kind of state or quasi state or public services that we should be putting our money into that and makes life much easier.
Well, we have a question here. Thank you for that from <clears throat> Andrew Gilmore. And Andrew is asking the question. He's the deputy director of research here at the IIEA. Your friend Carl Bildt has spoken of the need for an Atlantic digital partnership between the EU and the US as a counterbalance to China's rising power uh, in this space. Do you agree with this idea? And is there a tension between it and the idea of digital sovereignty in Europe, which seems often to be couched in terms, as you've said, of European autonomy from the, from the US? There is a brilliant paper written by someone who actually has an Irish name, <laughs> but I don't know if he is, who was head of uh, policy at um, GCHQ. I'm trying to look where his last name is first. His name is Curran Martin. C Definitely Irish. <laughs> what? Well, Definitely Irish. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, C-I-O-R-A-N Martin. Uh, but he was head of po policy at GCHQ, so he's probably a UK citizen. Yeah. And he's uh, teaching now or researching now at Oxford. Okay. And he has, I, have, I mean, it has not been published, and I heard he wasn't even thinking of publishing it, but he has a, had a brilliant talk a long paper on the need for cooperation between the European Union and the United States and other liberal democracies uh, against the China threat. And the China threat, not so much um, a militarily, but economically, where they're just the, huh. that they just have, they are, for them, um, I mean, these things are strategic investments and there's and strategic subsidies all to make Chinese tech, not only in 5G, but in all respects dominant in the rest of the world, which of course he's very worried about. So I would suggest Andrew to get in touch with Kieran Martin at Oxford. Yes, that's a good idea. I think his paper. He I think he's, he has spoken here at the IIE on, on another occasion, so we'll certainly follow up on that. I have a question here from Sarah Kenny, a political science and geography student at University College Dublin. And she asked the question about the increase in surveillance that accompanies digitalization and the response to security threats, if this is a reason for concern. Well, First of all, I mean, when people talk about surveillance, they think of the government. I mean, sort of 1984 visions. However, you are far more surveilled, to use a non-word, but by the by the private sector. I mean, yeah. if you're seriously concerned, read this. It's the uh, I don't know which way. capitalism, the age of surveillance capitalism by Shoshona Zuboff. Yes, thank and, you. Yeah, I mean, it's, for example, in the United States, it is, I mean, this just happened la a year ago. It is forbidden for the government, you know, whatever government agencies to, uh, uh, to do surveillance on US nationals. So what did, but pr the private sector can. And so, what did the what did ICE, the uh, you know the anti -immig the immigrant immigration police do? They hired a private company to <laughs> do the surveillance via your phones, and then they bought the material, they bought the information. Uh, this, I mean, everything is tracked via all social media. I mean, you know this. If you're on, uh, if you're on the internet, you have to always accept the cookies, right? Whatever newspaper, they're all you are tracked unbelievably much, and that, of course, is purchasable. So you don't really have to worry about 1984 and Big Brother because basically, in this commercial world, they can just follow you, just buy them, buy the information, hmm. and um, so I would say. I mean, yeah, and you don't even have that possibility 
say what the, the concrete uh, case I, I brought about ICE uh, buy, buying information on illegal immigrants was that um, it was tracked on your phone. I mean, these people who were apparently illegal were tracked on their phone by a private company that then sold the data of their location to the US government. So I think this is one of the, one of the, this is one of the things that we will face unless you become an utter Luddite and, and cut yourself off from any contact. Um, well, then, then you're okay. Otherwise, you know, this is, these are part of the changes we're only now beginning to realize. I mean, up, yeah. till, up till the middle of uh, the 1990s, uh, you know, you, if you left home, no one knew where you were. Um, I mean, before the smartphone, I mean, you had a Nokia phone, right? Just a plain little flip phone or something. You, uh, you were no longer, you could be identified. You could be, we, we, you could be geolocated. Before that, you had a phone, it was plugged in the wall, you walked out of the house, no one knew where you were. Today, that, you can always be found and identified. Yeah. And do you think that the private sector is taking cybersecurity seriously? No. You know, as board members, uh, no. uh, you know, exec senior executives? No. You know, I mean, you had the, the really horrible case of um, I mean, incredibly irresponsible case of, of um, Equifax, mm. which is a credit rating agency in the United States that had. Basically, they had 150 million people's credit ratings and about 11 million in the UK also. And they were hacked. Uh, first, I mean, they were hacked. They had been warned, as were all kinds of other companies, that a certain software they had, they would not, that uh, had to be patched in order to prevent it from being hacked. They did not patch the software. They were hacked. And the data for about 150 million residents of the United States and, and some Canadians and some UK residents was stolen. They found out it was stolen. They did not even report it for mm. until the, the, the uh, at least the CEO and some members of the board sold their stock in their own company because they knew it was plummeting. Yeah, I mean, this is all completely illegal, but uh, but in terms of responsibility for patching and all that's I mean that is companies are not responsible. I, I think that uh, I mean as their own sort of selling point who does take it seriously is Apple, from my experience, compared to the other companies providing the same services. And that's their whole marketing tool. I mean, they advertise, and rightly so, that we take privacy seriously, the other ones don't, right? So it's... Mm -hmm. uh, I've a question here. Thank you for that. Um, I did, Thomas, the question from Andrew Rue, InfoSec consultant at BCC Risk Advisory. Do you think that increased focus on security and digital sovereignty might result in segmentation of the internet under the two spheres of interest? Uh, for example, North America, EU, Russia, and China. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, certainly on the part of, <clears throat> I think there are three approaches. Broadly speaking, we have the <clears throat> the utterly free market uh, capitalist surveillance model pursued by the United States. Then we have, in to a greater extent, in China because it's just good, and to a lesser degree because in Russia because they're not <coughs> uh, algorithmic authoritarianism. I mean, just keeping track of everything and everybody and doing the same thing that the, you know, that Google does, but they're doing it, they're, they have an additional pipe that goes to the government and the social credit model that has been developed in, 
China where you get plus and minus points for various behaviors that then determine what you are allowed to do and further in life is a good example. And that is Orwellian. Mm -hmm. And then what is not yet really, I mean, this is what all these EU policies I would assume are going to be focusing on is what approach do we take in Europe? We are far more privacy uh, uh, oriented than North America. Uh, certainly we are far more <laughs> basic uh, human rights oriented than the authoritarians, but we haven't really put out an effective model. But if there's going to be a, uh, a I don't know what you call it. I mean, if, you, if you are going to have a splintering of the internet, which is a distinct possibility, it will first and foremost, I think, and I hope, go along the lines of authoritarian uh, human rights, uh, ignoring versus uh, liberal democratic and human rights respecting. How that will turn out, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you, we, we, Tomas. We've had lots of questions. I'm just going to finish on this one. We're just coming up to quarter past 12 or quarter past one with you. And it kind of follows up on that then. How should the EU respond to cyber attacks from external actors? In 2020, the EU imposed sanctions against Russia and Chinese-based actors for cyber attacks. Is this the right, is this a step in the right direction? And that's from Seamus Allen here at the IIEA. <clears throat> well, up till now, with few a few exceptions, uh, Western governments have uh, shunned the hack back. The hack back meaning that if you are hacked, you do it to them. In fact, in the in the United States, it's, it's explicitly forbidden to private companies that get hacked to hack back. Um, because you, you, you kind of, I mean, if you figure out who's, who did it, you can go get them, right? Um, but we need stronger responses, I think. And here, um, I mean, the EU, I think, is actually at a, in a better position. Uh, basically, you have, the, you have the European arrest warrant. You can forbid anybody engaged in this activity from coming into the European Union. And which is, I mean, that, you know, maybe not if you're your average Russian hacker, you're not going to go to the US, but certainly you love to go to, you know, the French Riviera or wherever. Um, and that has to be a European response. I mean, for Ireland or for Estonia to say, you can't come to my country because you did this bad thing. Eh. But if it's all of the EU, yeah. Then it becomes there. Then I mean, it becomes like a problem, right? Mm. Now with the UK gone, they'll all go to London, but that's a different matter. Uh, <laughs> in any case, I would say a pan-European approach to this, and then we can move on to stronger sanctions. And certainly, you can um, um, do s smart approaches. The problem, rather, in the European Union, is no one wants to do anything in this regard. Well, unfortunately, time has caught up with us. Uh, so thank you so much for your, for your time and for your exploration of those threats uh, and challenges in such a graphic way so that we remember them. Very important. And your recommendation for a pan-European approach, I think, is, is critical. And, uh, you know, I'm optimistic at this stage in Europe that they are open more to these ideas and the whole area of integration and cooperation. It will take time, but it's people like you, uh, President Ilves, that you have to keep talking about this in the way you do in such an inspiring way. So I'd like to thank you for your contribution. We've lots and lots more questions, so you'll definitely have to come back again. Hopefully <clears throat> with the vaccine and everything else, it, it will be in person. Um, so um, I'd like to thank Lorcan Mullally today, our IEA production team, who managed to, to get you back, to get you here and get you back again. That, that was very good. And to Seamus Allen, our digital policy researcher. And to your audience, thank you so much for 
your attendance, but also for your active participation. They are very, they loved your presentation, Tomas. So thank you very much again. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. And in the meantime, stay well and keep safe. Thank you.